Well, wow. hello, everyone. Welcome to another Soothkeep live stream. As always, please give us a thumbs up if you have good audio and video. Our guest tonight is Brandon Holthouse, pastor of the Rock Harbor Church in Bakersfield, California, and a regular speaker on the conference circuit. So I'm seeing the thumbs up. We are golden. I do want to mention that I'm back to my old platform for the live stream. I was having some issues with the new uh, platform. I haven't quite got all the bugs ironed out. It does give clearer video. It does give clearer audio, but we need a little work yet. So let's go right to the program. We're going to run for about an hour. Then we're going to do some Q&A. And today's topic is the rapture, prophetic convergence, and scoffers. So Brandon, yeah, there's going to be people in the audience, no doubt, that are either young Christians or have never been in prophecy before. What is the rapture? Well, the rapture is the, the great promise of the church that the church uh, will not see condemnation. And the, the condemnation that it's referring to is the wrath of God that's going to be poured out in the seven year tribulation. And uh, this is what Paul is referring to in uh, First Thessalonians um, chapters four and five. Um, and so it's the it was a mystery. And when it, when it says it's a mystery, this is Paul's language in First Corinthians chapter 15. A mystery just means that it wasn't discussed in the Old Testament. And so now it's new information that's being revealed in the uh, or sorry, in the Old Testament. Now it's being revealed in the New Testament. And there are actually eight mysteries that got revealed in the New Testament and then two satanic mysteries that were revealed in the New Testament. And so the rapture is one of them. Uh, the body of Christ is actually another mystery that was not discussed in the, the Old Testament. And so, um, and so now that we're in the church age and, and, uh, and uh, obviously um, there were things that, that have now been discussed. And one of them is the rapture. So what it means then is that uh, Jacob's trouble is not for the church. Uh, the body of Christ, and that uh, before that great uh, judgment uh, that comes on the, the scene, uh, the church is promised to be taken out of here, um, snatched away, if you will, as the word indicates, and um, we'll go to the Bema seat uh, to, to receive our rewards uh, or lose rewards based on how we lived our Christian lives. And then we come back with Christ at the second coming. So Amen. the rapture is not the second coming. Uh, we we come back with him. The bride has made herself ready in Revelation 19. So long story short, it's our great blessed hope, which a lot of people are trying to take away these days. So you you alluded to it a little bit, but what is the purpose for taking the church out of the world before the tribulation? Yeah, it, it's it's because of. Christ being uh, uh, taking our wrath on the cross. And so what you end up, I remember one of my professors at Liberty saying, you get into a situation that if you're going to have the church go through wrath uh, in which Christ has, says, that there, and Paul says this, there's no condemnation uh, that's going to be leveled against the church. Then you get an issue, uh, what we call double jeopardy, where uh, if Christ has taken our wrath on the cross for our sins, then why would we experience God's wrath again? That that doesn't make sense from a legal standpoint. And that's why my eschatology professors at Liberty said that you get into a situation theologically of double jeopardy. Um, you can't be condemned if Christ has already been condemned for you. And 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 so the church then is given that promise uh, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. So you have that established, but um, you have a, a very tricky theological problem if you say the church is going to come under condemnation or ra the wrath of God. Uh, and we're not talking about wrath in general, like like Romans chapter one type of wrath that, you know, uh, the wrath of God is being revealed in, in, in what people do right now. That's general uh, reaping and sowing. The wrath that Paul's referring to is the tribulation wrath. It's very right. distinct. It's, it's different. Um, then even trials and tribulations, because people will say, well, well, Brandon, there's Jesus said we'd have trials and tribulations. Yet not that kind of tribulation. No, no. Um, uh, that that's that's promised to come in the seven year tribulation. That is that is totally different. 
And if you can't make that distinction and you don't see that distinction theologically, then you start merging things together. And then you have a case of double jeopardy uh, on a legal standpoint. And uh, and then you have the church, you know, being in a time of wrath uh, during the tribulation period. So you got major problems there. Um, don't want to get too technical, but um, the main reason, bottom line it, is because Christ took our wrath on the cross. And so the, the church has promised not to be, uh, not to go uh, su suffer under the wrath of God. And, and a lot of people today, they really struggle with calling the judgments of the 70th week wrath up until you get up into the trumpets and, and the bowls. But to yeah. me... When you look at the seals, the fourth seal alone takes 25% of the world's population. That's 20 times the, the, the biggest death toll estimate for World War II. How in the world is that not end times wrath? Yeah, and in and, and, and Revelation chapter 6, you can see uh, in the passage that the people, you know, are, are, are saying uh, hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. So um, the statement that John makes is, is, is pointing backwards to the antecedents of the uh, the seal judgments being broken by the Lord and the interpretation <clears throat> based on what the scripture is saying in chapter six is that all the seals are wrath. That's right. It's the fact that he's breaking them uh, indicates that. And that passage points back to that. So it doesn't point forward. It actually points backwards. And, um, and so, uh, and then, and then just let's take a step back from just that immediate context of chapter six. The whole book of Revelation is laid out in a uh, uh, a, a systematic order, um, that, and John does this in um, I think Revelation one nineteen, where it says the things that you have seen, the things that are, and the things that will take place later. And what you see is actually a chronology in, laid out in the book of Revelation, which is, is fascinating because it's the first time that um, the prophetic scenario has actually been was put into a chronological sequence that we could have the order. As you guys know, if you've studied the Old Testament of prophecy, it's it's a patchwork. It's like a mosaic and you have to piece things together and stuff like that. You get a little bit of consistency of, of, of order with Daniel's four kingdoms. But the book of Revelation puts everything in order. Um, and when you see that, the outline is, okay, so he, the things he sees, with his, which is Christ, and then the things that, that are, the church, you see the seven churches and the church age, and then from what Revelation 4, 1 on to, you know, the end of chapter 18, you're looking at a picture of the tribulation where the church is not there, but it's dealing with Israel. And, and so you take a step back and you start seeing the overall context of not only Revelation, but the whole the whole period, which is Jacob's trouble, it's named for Israel, um, and all the different names that are associated to it has nothing to do with the church. Uh, it has to do primarily with the judgment of not only the Gentile nations, but of Israel itself right. to break the power of the holy people, Daniel chapter 12. So so you have to take a step back and, and understand there's more going on here than just, you know, even the passage of Revelation chapter 6. It's the, it's the totality of the last days. Now, here's another distinction. And even Tommy Ice makes this point, And I agree with Tommy Ice about this, that, that you must make a distinction between the last days of the church and the last days of Israel, too. And unfortunately, if you don't know your scriptures too well, you'll blend the two together. And that's a big mistake. Yes. The last days of Israel refer to their time in the tribulation and then extending into the 75 day interval, the second, obviously the second coming. And then the Messianic Kingdom. Um, and you have to keep that those separate um, from the last days of the church. And which, again, uh, we're in that those last days and we can go in that rabbit trail if we want to. But <clears throat> what, what's happening right now is we have an overlap. And so we're seeing the birth pains of Israel's last days, getting that set up and then. We're in the church age where it's starting to end now for us as well, based on other criteria. That's right. And I think that distinction that Tommy Ice made, and it's a very good distinction. I've heard other guys make it too. He's not the only one uh, of understanding the book of Revelation, that you're looking at the last days of Israel and her judgment. That's right. During that period of time. So anyway, I could go on and on, but I'll stop. 
<laughs> well, let's let's go on to the subject of convergence. We we've, we've looked at the subject of the rapture, laid a good foundation here. Yeah. Now we talk about prophetic convergence. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about prophetic convergence, what are we talking about? Yeah, prophetic conver convergence is like I said, you can you can you could be looking at um, birth pains of Israel, obviously. Like, uh, let's just start with Israel and stay there for a second. So we know for the last days of Israel uh, uh, that things have to be in place for for the prophetic scenarios to actually happen. So number one, Israel has to become a nation. So we can, we know that. Uh, so that's a birth pain of 1948 becoming a nation. Um, you you have the other birth pains of, of Israel re recapturing Jerusalem, 1967, and getting the mountains back. Uh, they have to have control of the mountains for Ezekiel 38 and 39. Uh, they have to have they have to they have the control of Israel, uh, Jerusalem also for the Temple Mount because um, eventually because the temple will be rebuilt uh, the Jewish temple it's not sanctioned by God but it's going to be rebuilt so you have to have those things are in place and and then that's another uh, kind of convergence because we hear about rumors that hey, may I was in Israel you know a couple weeks ago and they're telling me man they can get this temple thing uh, up like within thirty days wow. You know, because they, they have all the stuff they need. They're ready to go. It's just a matter of having access and where to build it, you know, on the Temple Mount. But they're ready to go. Um, so that's another, like, birth pain convergence. And then you go beyond Israel, and then you start looking at other things that coincide with her. And we would refer to, like, the times of the Gentiles, for instance, that Daniel predicted. And and pr primarily the, the Fourth Empire that he talked about, the Roman Empire or, or imperialism. And what we understand from that is that there's five stages in that last empire. And we're in stage two, where you have the two leg, two division stage, the two legs of Daniel's metallic man. And the next stage that we go to, the third stage, is globalism, is yeah. a global government. <clears throat> and and you know, you you probably in the same camp with me, man. We used to talk about global government, you know, 10, 15 years ago, maybe even 20 years ago. They used to laugh at us saying, man, you guys are a bunch of conspiracy theorists. And uh, now it, it's not a conspiracy theory. They say it. They want a global government. The guys at yeah. Davos last week were talking about global government. So that's another birth pain because Daniel had predicted that. So there's another uh, uh, birth pain of that forming, or at least the stage setting of that. There's just another convergence. And then you have the convergence, obviously, of the last days of the church. I could go on and on about Israel, but the, the last days of the church is the great apostasy, that, that the church is going to end in apostasy. Perilous times will come in the latter days. So what is reflected in the culture will be reflected in the church, which, for goodness sakes, we're seeing it now. I mean, I mean, can you imagine uh, the day that we're now seeing where you have transgender pastors? And I put those in quotes. Uh, they're not pastors, but they're pretending to be. Um, uh, this is unprecedented and, and the falling away is, is more than we've ever seen before. It's worse than we thought. Um, so you have that converging. So it, what, what you do is then you start having these, all these prophetic scenarios happen, whether it's dealing with Israel, you're dealing with church, you're dealing with global government, you're dealing with maybe the, maybe a, a, a digital currency, uh, perhaps because of what revelation 13 talks about, um, AI plays into that. So you're seeing all these pieces of the puzzle that the Bible talks about converging kind of at the same time, all happening, all stage setting. And in the middle of all of that, and when we see all these birth pains, not only for Israel, but when we see the, the last day's church and, and the apostasy and all the things related to the, the great apostasy, you sit back and you're thinking, we must be close for the rapture then. That's right. Because, yes, the, 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 rapture, the rapture is a signless event. It, it, it's imminent. It means nothing has to happen before it or anything. It's, it's imminent. And, and um, what we understand is that the end of the church age is coming to an end. And the, the, the last days of Israel, is it, the birth pains are happening for the tribulation. And that means that somewhere in the season, and that's the word I would probably use best, in that season, we have to be raptured before this tribulation starts with Israel, uh, before they sign a covenant with the, 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 uh, the, the Antichrist. So to say that, and then I know that's what we're getting ready to talk about, that that you you that we, we can divorce 
somewhat the, the, the rapture from the convergence of all the signs of the last days of the church and the last days of Israel uh, kind of is a misnomer. Um, that, that actually, the convergence of things is actually making us more aware that we're very close in the season of the rapture. We don't know the day or the hour, but Paul said we would know the season. We're not sons of darkness. We're sons of light. That's right. And, and so, therefore, that's why we talk about uh, the rapture being in the season. Now, Walverd, I, I remember him telling us I, he was a guest lecturer one time at uh, Liberty. And they brought him in for uh, an intensive. And Walverd used a great analogy. I think I talked to you on the phone uh, about this analogy. And he says, um, in America... He said, um, when you see Christmas decorations, you know that Thanksgiving is near. And and that kind of put it in perspective because that's true. You know, we we, we see all these things happening that's going to happen in the tribulation for Israel and and, uh, you know, world and world government, possible digital currency, all this other stuff. Well, then for that to happen, then something else must happen because we know we're promised to be raptured prior to the tribulation. That's right. So. Therein, there is our expectation of the rapture, right? So just like we would expect Thanksgiving to happen before Christmas, but we're seeing the Christmas decorations already be put out, is what Walver was trying to say. Now, when I try to give that analogy in other countries, they don't get it because uh, a lot of them don't celebrate Thanksgiving, I guess. But I tried to use that in, in uh, England or somewhere. Oh, and yeah. It, it just fell. It, it didn't go anywhere because the concept of Thanksgiving, they knew Christmas, but they, the concept of Thanksgiving was foreign. Um, but, uh, anyway, I, I think the analogy fits well, um, that, uh, that, you know, you're seeing all these things that, that we're not going to be here for, but my, for goodness sakes, I'm seeing the setup right in front of my very eyes. I mean, how can you deny, uh, uh the, them wanting a global government or how they would actually do it? And, and now with AI and the technology that we see, how, how are you, how, how does people not acknowledge that? It's possible for one guy to rule the world. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's 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 totally within the grasp of of that, and we're living in that kind of time periods. So, well, so it's um exciting in one sense, I guess, and bit you know, and and bitter in another sense because it means we're getting closer to the rapture, but it also means things are going to get worse here on the on this planet um, for a lot of for a lot of people. No, but, there, uh, yeah. Oh, go ahead. But 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 yeah, I I think that's where uh, uh, there that that misnomer that you and I were talking about that um, that uh, imminence and prophetic convergence, like you said, are, are uh, you know, that they they're claiming that it, they're mutually exclusive, and I don't know how you can make that claim. Uh, I I I don't they they kind of go hand in hand in, in what I'm seeing in the prophetic scenario. I think what's happened is you have people that are trying to be too simplistic in their thinking. So they take this idea, uh, which I think is, is got a lot of truth in it, that there's no particular sign must precede the rapture. No particular sign points to the rapture. In fact, no particular set of signs. You, can, you can't list them and say these things prove the rapture is going to be next week, next year, next month. But, the whole package as a whole, it's virtually impossible to have that whole package of convergence and not have that creeping into the world prior to the rapture. Um, yeah, excellent point. Uh, and I think you're right. Um, simplistic is a good way of putting it. Compartmentalization is another way of putting it as well. Yeah. And, and and that's a, you, that, as a believer, um, compartmentalization will get you in trouble if you start thinking in those types of terms. And what we have to do is we have to harmonize our holistic picture of what, what, what the, the Bible is trying to portray to us about the prophetic scenario. If you isolate things, that's when you get into trouble. Um, and, and there's, there's a, even a hermeneutic principle too, you know, um, that, that tries to get people to think holistically uh, as far as the analogy of scripture, that scripture interprets scripture. And, and the fact that, you know, I noticed this. This is interesting, Lee, that um, theologians that are not systematic, um, that um, tend to isolate a passage without the broader understanding of what the rest of the, the 66 books say about that particular subject, 
Yep. This is what I find out when they, they refuse to, to do a systematic that they tend to uh, really mess up their eschatology and, 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 and not bear in what, what, okay, what are these other scriptures saying about this particular subject matter um, uh, of eschatology and, and whatnot. And uh, they end up, um, I, I noticed uh, those who do that end up being post or historical uh, in their interpretations, preterists and, and whatnot, because they're, they're, they're sticking on one text and not bringing the whole counsel of God to bear in on the subject matter. And that's, I think, could be, could be contributing to this idea that these two things of prophetic convergence and an imminence are mutually exclusive. Possibly. Yep. No, I agree. Absolutely agree. If to me, dividing imminence and and uh, prophetic convergence is like kind of like dividing the Holy Spirit and the Lord Jesus Christ, or like dividing justification and sanctification. You can distinguish these things, but if you divide them, you're making a serious error. Yeah, Ooh. yeah, and, and and you'll do the opposite of rightly dividing because. You know, um, like I said, you know, whether you know, and all doctrines are like this, whether you're dealing with the Trinity or you're dealing with the hypostatic union of Christ or eschatology or whatever study, you have to have a systematic. You have you have to have an, uh, uh, how other scriptures are bearing in on that. And, and what ends up happening, um, the, the mistake I see a lot of people is isolating texts and um and, and and that it ends it, it leads him to wrong conclusions. That's right. If that makes sense, it sure because, does. Because look, man, there's pieces of the puzzle, and and this is why prophecy is hard. I'm not I'm not saying it's easy. I mean, you and I we've been studying it for decades, okay? And it's taken a lot. And I get it for the average average Christian out there studying prophecy. It's a challenge. It's it's no doubt. Uh, a maturity issue as far as having to study. You had to put some time in. But what you start finding out is the way the prophetic scenario is laid out a lot of times is it's uh, a patchwork. It's a mosaic. And you have to take here from Daniel and you have and 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 make and look go to the all of discourse and you're in and you're in other minor prophets, you're in major prophets or and you're you're doing your best to to harmonize. And that takes a lot of work, it and does. I think it's a la it's a lazy man, a lazy man's interpretation, not to do that, and just isolate a text and say, well, it doesn't say that in this text, but because I, 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 I've seen it, I've seen it, and then it becomes a, a out of context, and it becomes a pretext for a wrong view, a view obviously. So, so sorry about my soapbox, but I see no, it. that's all right. Now, you and I recently watched a video clip that's been going around uh, where Eric Metax is, is in interviewing Ben Thomas, yeah. and they get talking about the evils of the pre-trib rapture, despising the pre-trib rapture, despising imminence, despising prophetic convergence. I'm going to play a clip here. Okay. We've got two minutes. You know, from... Hal Lindsay's the late great planet Earth, or whatever, that the Antichrist is going to come. It's going to be sick, bad, horrible. Uh, the saints get raptured whoosh, out of here. Um, that's kind of the narrative that is not challenged very much. And what is that called? That's called a pre trib rapture. Well, it's called uh, dispensationalism. You know, there's a lot of words for it. Uh, but actually, it's, I call it the rescue rapture. It, we get rescued from uh, the grips of Satan who's about to destroy us with the Antichrist. And that's generally what we've been taught for a long, long time. Okay, and so you and I talked about this, and one of the downsides of that view, and I have talked about this a lot from, from a different perspective, but what it makes a lot of Christians do is say, I don't give a darn about this world. That's not biblical, folks. You're supposed to give a darn about this world. Jesus saves you uh, and fills you with the Holy Spirit so you can be uh, living out his will and his power in this world for his purposes in this world. But if you believe it's all going to go to heck in a handbasket 
and I'm going to get raptured out of here. The, the memo is, so therefore, don't do anything. It's all going to burn. It's all going to burn. So you know what? I'm just going to, we're going to have my quiet time. I'm going to have a nice time with the Lord on Sundays, and I'm not going to do anything because I'm out of here. That uh, is not biblical. So, man. wow, where, where, where do you begin? I, I cannot believe him and that guy went there. I, I mean, wow. Um, that's a call, to, ladies and gentlemen, that's called a straw man argument. You make up an argument that we're not making or that we're, we're, we're doing something that we're really not. And then you knock it down. Um, I'm sorry, but um, you have some intellectual in integrity issues uh, going on there. Um, with both Eric Metaxas and this Benjamin Thomas, who I've never heard of in my whole entire life. Um, at the end of this clip, there I have quotes that I wrote down. He says that the doctrine of the pre-trib, uh, basically indicting dispensationalism and pre-tribulationalism, is from the pit of hell. Yeah. And, call, and calls it bad theology. Hey, Eric. Dude, you're so theologically out of line by saying that. And so are you, Benjamin Thomas. You, you do not get to say that. Uh, it is a definite orthodox position in Christianity. You may, you may disagree with it, but you can't say it's from the pit of hell or that it's bad theology. Um, that right there tells me you guys have an axe to grind, and I don't know why. But your motive is not intellectual, nor is it academic. You must have an axe to grind. And you're going you're gonna to suffer your credibility for saying stupid things like that. But we can unpack this in more. Uh, but that's my initial yeah. comment from that. Well, to me, one of the things he said is, you know, well, the world's going to heck in a handbasket and, and we're not going to do anything and we don't really care. I mean, <laughs> the first thing that comes to my mind is, wait a minute. The church has not been doing anything. We're not doing anything. The church has been engaged for 2,000 years. Yeah, I, I, I don't know where he's getting that from because I, I can tell you this. The most people that are engaged are dispensationalist uh, Christians for the most part. And, yep. it's and, and it's those who believe in the rapture and believe in imminency and believe. Why? Because imminency creates holiness and urgency in the believer to be salt and light, to, 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 to share the gospel. It is the opposite of what he just said. Yep. Now, he, he went on this attack and says that uh, these, these uh, rescue Christians or, or rescue rapture um, uh, makes Christians uninterested in the world and they don't give a darn. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, Eric. And he says that they, they, it causes them to sit on the sidelines. They don't go to school board meetings. Um, well, I'm, I do go to school board meetings and I'm, Free trib. I do I try to affect our community. We support the Bakersfield Pregnancy Center and the Kern County Right to Life, and we're trying to stop abortion. What are you talking about? In fact, I want to say, Eric, the churches that, that have you in, when you talk at their churches, they are pre-trib, pre-millennial, and they're the ones doing the work in California. Like, for instance, Jack Hibbs Church that you get invited to to speak at, Jack Hibbs is the most politically active guy in California. How can you say that? So, so my thing is, you say we're they're, they say we're not compassionate because you know we we just let it go to Hades in a handbasket, and we and and then he goes on in in the clip and says we actually delight in the bad things that are going on. Again, another straw man, but says that we take delight when the world's going to, to, to Hades in a handbasket, that we're we're applauding that and that we're we're thinking this is great. Um, and that we're unpatriotic. He says we're unpatriotic because we're not helping the nation get back to God. I'm sorry, but but it's us in the pre-trip camp camp that are actually the most politically active, dude. Take a look at your stats. I'm yep. sorry, you're wrong. What's interesting, too, is this whole concept of compassion. It's like they're begging the question. They erect a false dichotomy. Yeah. Because on the one side, you he's saying that if you have compassion, you're you're going to fix the world. And and basically, they're talking not just merely fixing the problems you can fix locally, 
but yeah, basically yeah. usher in the kingdom. Yeah. And, and if you're not going to do that, you don't have compassion. But over here is the whole dispensational camp manifesting tons of compassion, doing good, all kinds of ministries, doing good with preaching the gospel, doing good to the world, being the salt and the light. It's just that in their perspective, compassion has to have a, a gospel emphasis first and to fix the world emphasis second. And they also understand that uh, we're not going to change the world, but we're going to be a testimony of righteousness as much as we can. We're going to challenge, slow, hinder whatever we can do, because all of that is an opportunity to be salt and light and to preach the gospel. Amen. And and to, to, the, to that point, let me add, add to it, because if people listen to the rest of the clip, the guy lets the cat out of the bag. Uh, this uh, Benjamin Thomas who wrote Revelation Riddle, Kingdom Age of the Saints. Well, I knew in the title, I said, that sounds fishy. And then I just listened to the clip and let this guy continue to talk. <laughs> and then what does he say? He says, we're, we're, it prevents the, the Christians from completing the seven pillars. Bingo, got you. I know exactly where you're coming from. The seven pillars is another phrase for the seven mountain mandate where they want to yep. target education, religion, family, business, government, arts, and entertainment and media. You know where that comes from? That's NAR stuff, a new apostolic reformation. That's dominionism. That's kingdom building. Oh, now I understand why you're saying what you're saying. You guys don't understand the messianic kingdom. That's right. That's your problem. And 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 uh, Lee, Lee, if you dig into if anyone wants to dig into the seven pillar, seven mountain mandate, you got guys like Glenn Beck and, and and that are kind of pushing this and they don't know where it comes from. But the what people must understand is the 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 seven pillar, seven mountain mandate comes from a guy by the name of and I can I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, Lance Wallenau or Wallanu or something like that. It's, it's Wall, then N-A-U, Lance Wallanau or New. Anyway, it's a reform of replacement theology, which everybody should light up when you hear replacement theology, the church replacing Israel, okay? And what it happens is they borrow from the Abrahamic covenant, which is made to Israel, obviously. We're grafted in, but it's made to Israel, the land and all that, and the government and all this, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the Davidic dynasty and whatnot. And then they borrow from Deuteronomy 28, where Israel was claiming is supposed to be the head of the nations, uh, not the tail one day in the future in the Messianic kingdom. They take that and they apply it to themselves as Christians mm -hmm. and the church. They're taking a nationalistic promise to Israel and saying, we're, we're going to be the head of the nations and not the tail by putting Christians in governmental positions and all these seven pillars. And then we're going to Christianize the world and that will usher in the kingdom. And I want to say, excuse me, you're going to usher in the kingdom without Christ? What are you, crazy? Only Christ can usher in the messianic kingdom. And he's the one who brings it at the second coming. We are not doing that. So that tells me right there, fundamentally, I know what happens when, they, when those types of individuals interpret the Great Commission. They put kingdom building ahead of the gospel. That's right. Like you said. And you can't reverse that order. If we're going to change the culture, it has to start with changing the hearts of people by getting them saved. And the more people get saved, the more can it affect a, a culture. Okay, so what happens in our culture when people are not responding to the gospel? Well, then you're not going to affect the culture that much. It's to become thoroughly more pagan rather than more Christian if you have less converts. That's right. So at the end of the day, what Eric Metaxas and this guy is doing is pushing a dominionist kingdom now kingdom building eschatology and uh, i'm a little shocked by that but i he let the cat out of the bag and, and and so now i know what we're dealing with and i'm telling you that's you mess up the kingdom and you misinterpret what it, what the messianic kingdom is you're really going to get off in 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 your christianity because i can tell you where it leads what where i've seen this lead where i see dominionism where i see new apostolic reformation and where i see kingdom now junk 
it always leads to a social gospel That's eventually. Right. And they end up in the same ditch as the Marxists who are trying to build a utopia through their mechanisms, but the Christians are kind of doing their thing, trying to build a utopia without Christ, but they're calling it the kingdom. And they end up social justice warriors every time. I, I haven't seen an exception from it. Yeah, it, and it's tragic. It, one of the things I think about is, don't they? I mean, this is ABC stuff here to know the difference between the Father's throne in heaven and David's throne down here on earth, to know yeah. the difference between providential government of God that's in heaven right now operating. The providential government allows evil down here. When the messianic yeah. kingdom comes, evil is not allowed down here. Folks, that's right, the rod of iron, right? These are so different. How does anybody confuse them? I don't know, but I, I think they take advantage. You know, someone gets a platform like Eric Metaxas, he writes books or whatever, and, and they get some credibility. And then all of a sudden, I'm watching the pattern, Lee. They get some credibility, they've had credibility, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, boom, total like 180, does something stupid, says something stupid, like off the wall, uncharacteristic. And I, I've been watching this pattern. And I'm wondering, is that part of the great apostasy? Um, you know, um, because when you diverge uh, from orthodox beliefs and to where you're kingdom building, kingdom now stuff, which is not orthodox, yep. what happened to you? I don't know. Uh, but I, I'm seeing the same pattern. And, and we're seeing you. You can testify to this. We've seen guys that we that were solid and was going really good. And all of a sudden, boom, they're like not in this in the same camp. Hank Hendergraff did the same thing when he was the Bible answer man, that he followed Dr. Walter Martin. And there for a long time, he, you, you, you seem to think that Hank was um, on the same page with Dr. Walter Martin on a lot of things. Then, you know, obviously Dr. Walter Martin died and time went on. And all of a sudden, Hank comes out, boom, preterist, just like right out of the box. And then starts demonizing premillennialism and dispensationalism and calling it the theology of Tim LaHaye and, and stuff like that in the Left Behind series and starts demonizing it. And then we, we watch him as he continues on. And then what does he do? He apostatizes and, and, and goes into a works-based system from Christianity. And, and it's, just, it's that same thing. And, and again, I don't, I don't know if Eric Metaxas is following that, but therefore, I mean, most people would have held Eric Metaxas as legitimate. I can't consider him legitimate when you say that uh, now. When you make that type of attack on Orthodox Christianity and say it's from the pit of hell and it's bad theology, I'm done with you. No, and, and that's that's way beyond saying, I think you have some bad doctrine that's going to create issues. Right, or I disagree with this, and we're going to agree to disagree. That He went over, and it's not you and me doing it, he did. He threw the gauntlet down. Yep. And this is what I start seeing. It's like, why are these guys, all of a sudden, they're going, they're going, and then, boom, they throw the gauntlet down. And like, okay, we're done. Is there something spiritual going on? What's happening behind the scenes? I don't know. But I can tell you, by the nature of apostasy, this is what we're talking about. The yep. falling away starts happening. And, and the biggest critics that you and I get, that people need to understand, is not some atheist dude railing against me on the internet. It's inside the church is where that's I right. get the most pushback. That's right. It's it's that's it's it's the the hirelings. It's the it's the tears among the wheat that give me the most problems, and give you the most problems, I'm sure too, because it, it it's it's an in, in it starts in house. So that's anyway, right. I, I can't believe these guys went there. I can't believe they said that we're an unpatriotic. Um, that we, we could care less about the nation, that we don't go to school board meetings. Uh, I was reading, um, when I was looking at that video, I was reading people's comments. And like 99% of the comments disagreed with him. And I, I hope you read his feed to realize that everything he said, everyone, 99% of them uh, disagreed with what he said, saying like, you're totally out of line by saying that, man. Saying that we're uninterested, not involved. That's that's I, I hadn't watched his feed while I was watching the video. I probably should have, 
But um, what's interesting, if that's the case, most of his audience then is disagreeing with him. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I scroll through all the comments. I'm, I'm telling you, about 99% totally disagreed. There was like one or two maybe that that agreed with him, and the rest of it was like, "What are you talking about? I'm I believe in the rapture. I'm pre-trib, and and I'm totally socially active in politics and vote." And everybody was making these comments. Well, how could you say that? And I don't know, um, when you start seeing a reaction like that, that tells you, you got, you, you stepped in some mud right here and you got yep. yourself in trouble. I don't know how he's going to back out of that because he's connected to other churches that are pre-trib, pre-millennial that are very politically active. Yes. And he's got, he, he's, he's probably going to have to apologize for saying that. I got another Clip, we've already kind of touched on it, but I want the folks to hear it anyways. Yeah. yeah. What I call the rescue rapture has really taken the church and put them on the sideline. People don't, for instance, run for Congress. They don't uh, you know, go to school board meetings. They don't participate in society because they believe that Jesus will come at any moment and rescue them. And I think that's the fruit of this rescue rapture there, uh, doctrine. There's that, one thing I want to tease out of that. There's another piece of that, right? On the one hand, they think Jesus is going to rescue them. On the other hand, there are a lot of people I've met that they're almost psyched to see the world go to hell. They're almost psyched to see everything get worse, like, ha ha, judgment is coming, ha, instead of being moved by compassion to help those who might be helped. They're, they're kind of <clears throat> glad to see it go downhill and again i'm just i'm flabbergasted i hardly know what to say i mean I, I, the church is on the sidelines and, and we're happy that the world's going to hell uh, I, I, what, excuse me what what are you talking about i have to live in this world i'm not happy it's going to hell i have to live in it my kids have to grow up in it what are you talking about dude yeah, what's, and, 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 what's interesting, too, is that you have, if they were going to find fault with somebody, why not find fault with the amillennial camp? I mean, the postmillennial <laughs> camp is politically active. Yeah. Uh, and, and the premillennial camp is is not only politically active, they're evangelically active. The, the oh, vast yeah. majority of the amillennial camp is, is just drifting. I mean, why not fault the amillennialists? Well, because they're on the same side of the fence with the anti pre trippers Exactly. Take the issue of Israel. Who's the biggest supporter of Israel? It's the pre-trib, pre-millennial evangelicals. That's right. That, that know Israel's place in the prophetic scenario. It's not an all-millennialist that has replacement theology, but yet they're going to go after us. But again, what? like I told you, I think on the phone that one day, who does the devil go after? Does he go after error? Or does he go after truth? He always goes after truth. That's right. And, and, and to malign everybody. And, 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 and the first thing you can tell by his derogatory malignment uh, is calling this the rescue rapture as if it's not a, a doctrine taught in Scripture, but something that's made up by man. The rescue rapture. Uh, excuse me. Um, that's a derogate. You're putting a derogatory term on a theological concept. Um, you can disagree uh, of when this thing will take place and fine, we'll, we'll debate you on that, but to mock it, you're mocking an essential doctrine. That's right. Uh, so we're, we're, what, what, what's going on with your theology when you're mocking, you're going to have to deal with the harpazo in, in first Thessalonians chapter four, you're going to have to deal with it in first, uh, uh, first Corinthians chapter 15. What is it to you? What do you call it? And so if you're going to uh, do a, a derogatory term toward the rescue rapture, which which refers to us that we're not willing to fight the battle, it refers to that we, we're just going to surrender and and put the white sheets on and be rescued because we 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 uh, we don't want to fight. Dude, that is such a straw man argument. I don't know where to begin. Yeah. Wow, dude. I, I mean, you needed to go check yourself on what before you made this this video to make an indictment towards the majority of people that that believe this, uh, believe in, in pre-trib, pre-millennial. Um, wow. Okay.
Um, What's really funny, it looks like what they're saying is if you're not doing work where you are intentionally trying to establish the kingdom in a post-millennial mindset in theology, if you're not intentionally doing that, then you're not doing anything worth doing. And it's like, what? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and again, you know, there is the confusion of what is the church's call? Yeah. Um, now, my church is very politically active. We're involved in a lot of things. I mean, we're in front of board, uh, school boards and whatnot. But my first priority is what the church is designed for. Uh, the Great Commission, the edification of the saints. And then those are secondary things that we will do as, it, as we try to affect the culture and the community and whatnot. But you're right. They're making it number one. And my thing is, well, how are you going to convince a culture who is unconverted that gay marriage is wrong if they're unconverted? That's right. I, I mean, what do you? What, and so they're so they're going to force, okay, through through their seven mountain mandate. We're going to get these people in position. We're going to have a you know a, a, a president that will force Christian theology on people like like Gary North's position. We're going to force that uh, and and bring it and and I, and our look. I did a paper at Liberty one time about this and about this whole uh, dominionism kingdom now thing. A lot of this seven mountain mandate stuff they want to force some of the mosaic law on people okay like the death penalty for homosexuals and stuff like that okay that's part of their theological thinking sometimes when we're not in that dispensation we're in the church age not in the mosaic theo theocracy um and, and so instead of convincing people of the truth of jesus christ and then then that letting its effect happen we're going to force people well, good luck with that one, because because the Catholic Church tried that and it didn't work. And they ended up burning people at the stake because they, they wouldn't force. They couldn't they wouldn't uh, accept their ideals. In so the early we, days of the Protestant Reformation tried too, and it, it was a havoc. Yeah, it, it were exactly. Exactly. So so at the end of the day, you can see how far you can get off. And you're right. If we're we're not getting uh running for office which i have people in my church that do run for office by the way they're politically motivated because of what we say but you know that's a secondary issue because uh, I, i'm 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 edifying that saint to do the work of ministry and then he goes beyond that and and affects the culture and affects everything but i'm not going to put the cart before the horse and, and that's what the, the seven mountain mandate, the seven pillars tries to do. But again, I'm going to try to convince an unregenerate person that they need to hold to Christian morals. I don't know. I don't, I don't see that working. No. And what's really interesting about this, the two different philosophies here is a premillennial gospel preaching philosophy and a post-millennial kingdom building philosophy. And it's yes. not that they don't preach the gospel at all. Right. And it's not that these people are not politically active at all. But when you approach this job of being salt and light in the world from these two different perspectives, it's really doing a very different thing. Now, ultimately, when you approach it from a premillennial perspective and you're preaching the gospel because that's your job, you, do, you don't believe, you deny that the world can be fixed but you believe that individuals can be fixed. Well, you're ultimately with that gospel going to actually do more good for the world than you would do if you were doing the kingdom building philosophy with the and minoring in the gospel, which almost always ends up degrading into the social gospel effort. People need to go back and read church history. Uh, yes, an ounce of history is worth a pound of theory, folks. You go back and you read on the first great awakening, what are you going to see? that the Wesleyan revival did more to change England than all the political activism for the previous century. That's right. Amen. And and that's that's the record of church history. And, and quite frankly, as you know, Lee, very few people understand 
the dynamics of church history and what was going on because of that. And those are demonstrations of that. That's right. Uh, 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 you know, the, the gospel first and then it affecting the culture. And 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 so so what do we got now? So so we, now we have a backward system. We're putting the, the the you know the cart before the horse. And a lot of times on this seven mountain mandate, these seven pillars, they will add in the dominion mandate in Genesis along with the Great Commission. Whoa, time out, time out, time out. The dominion mandates for nations, I get that, and it's valid, but you cannot mix that with the Great Commission, which they do. Yeah. And boy, howdy, you start doing that, you're in hot water theologically. But uh, yeah, I mean, this, and, and so what does this boil down to? Correct theology produces correct behavior. That's right. And, and, and so you get the kingdom wrong. Boy, howdy. Forget it. Um, you, you're going to get off. Uh, or, or any other doctrine, right? You know? Um, and, and so uh, Bible knowledge, Bible, Bible study, I, you, man, it, it's, it's lacking today. But this is why everyone's got to be up on their Bible knowledge. What's really interesting to me is these guys have been in the work of the Lord, some of them for two, three decades. Some of them four decades. Now, what I don't understand is when I was a young believer, only reading the Bible, just the Bible, for a year, I had the right answers to these questions. Why did can people go for two, three decades and not see it? The, the church, the world is not going to be fixed. The world is condemned already. Yeah. Our mandate is to call men out of the world and to be salt and light in the world. That's our mandate. Our, our mandate's not to fix the world. And, right. and that doesn't mean we should not do good as much as we can in our immediate communities. We should do as much good as we can. We should, we should wherever we have people with a vision to do social efforts that are handmaidens to the gospel, go after it because that opens the doors for the gospel. True. But with these people, when they think that the world can be saved, I mean, the plain statements of scripture, the world's going to be condemned. It's already condemned. Yeah. It, it, I mean, scripture already makes that point. So, so therein lies the balance of, 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 of understanding proper theology of how we relate to the world. That's right. And, and, and so, I'm not going to be able to stop globalism like you and I both know it's yep. predicted it's going to happen. That's right. Um, I'm not going to I'm not going to prevent perilous times. It's predicted it's going to happen. But I'm I'm going to be the salt and light on a personal level. I'm going to sound the alarm. I'm going to do what I can uh, to affect and push back evil as much as I can. But at the end of the day, my theology uh, doesn't make me a, an escapist. It That's doesn't right. make me a surrender to this. What it tells me is this is the way you should view reality. And this is how you relate to that reality. If you, and we're not going to save the world, we have to save souls first. That's, right. That's the priority and disciple and edify the saints. That's right. And like, look, at, and, and you go back to Acts chapter 15, the Jerusalem council got together and they couldn't figure out, okay, what, what is God doing with all these Gentiles, bringing them in? And yep. it said, he's gathering the people out of this world for him, for his name sake. Okay. That's, that's what the church is to be doing. That's right. And, 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 and that can, if you gather enough people can affect a society. And, and we've seen that through church history, but okay. So now let's bring prophecy back in. Prophecy tells us that the that that the church ends in apostasy. There's a remnant that believes, but the church ends in apostasy. That the church is not going to convert the world. In fact, we know from prophecy that the job is not completed by the church, which a lot of the, uh, people think it's going to be completed. But we see in 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 Matthew chapter 24 that the 144,000 have to has to take the gospel out the gospel kingdom to the rest of the world. That's right. And finish the job of, of witnessing to the entire world. The, ch the church doesn't even complete the job. That's right. Uh, and so you have these guys. This is funny. These dominionists will say, well, you know, you understand that there's only uh, about 300 more people groups to reach. And we're going to reach them by uh, 2025. And by that time, then Jesus will come back. And it's like, what did you just say? 
what did you just say that the church is going to complete the, the 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 and reach all people groups and then Jesus comes back when you come when you do that? Well, are, number one, your date setting, but number two, you don't understand eschatology. That's right. And and and, and so so even in that mindset of evangelism, and I'll even point this out to you. The the seven pillar guys. Their view of missions is far different than how you and I think. What do you mean? Well, a lot of uh, times we send missionaries to open doors where the van, it's hot, man. It's 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 on fire. The gospel's going and we're to go into all the world. No doubt about that. But because of limited resources, because of limited people that you can send them and because of closed doors and open doors, according to Revelation chapter three, what I open, no one can shut and what I shut, no one can open. You have even them they don't care so much about the number of conversions they only emphasize the where and this is what we dealt with when i was a southern baptist in the international mission board is they weren't concerned where the hot spots are where hundreds and thousands of people are getting saved they were more concerned that they had somebody in antarctica witnessing to penguins because in their mind they were focused in on the where not the who and so they were sending missionaries to closed door areas so they can say we've evangelized the world we went to all the world and i thought that's the total misunderstanding of the great commission that's, that's right the total misunderstanding of revelation chapter three of the open and closed door but anyway, it, it, it has that's the the far reaching implications. What I say when I when I talk about this, it's crazy. One last uh, brief snippet. You already mentioned this, but I want people to hear this. Okay. And let's call it what it is, folks. It's bad theology. And by the way, I want to be very clear. I say this in all my speeches. Bad theology, to be clear, is from the pit of hell. It's Thank Satan's you. theology. It's not like, oh, B minus theology. It's from the pit of hell, bad theology. And it leads us not to doing God's will. So, wow. So you and I are satanic, apparently. It's from the pit of hell. It's, it's satanic. Um, and we're not wow. doing God's will. We're not doing God's will. That's for sure, man. We, we are doing Satan's will. Uh, What's interesting point. here, it, to go down the path that they're calling God's will, which is the path of cleaning this world up and, and Christianizing the world, not necessarily seeing every soul saved, but Christianizing the world yeah. and dominating those seven mountains or those seven pillars or whatever they're going to call yeah. it. Whatever happened to the great apostasy that you've been talking about, whatever happened to God sending the world a great delusion so that every man ends up believing the Antichrist and taking the mark of the beast. The Antichrist and the tribulation and the mark of the beast have nothing to do with their eschatology. They don't even really have an eschatology. Yeah, you know, and I listened to that clip um, uh, uh, and, and people can listen to it too. And, and one of the things he says and I was kind of listening. Well, what do you guys think is next? And and there was like, well, you know, we've been taught it's going to get really, really bad, and we're going to be raptured, raptured in a really bad time. And that's not true, guys. What's really true is um, this kingdom age of the saints is coming. Yeah. And I want to say, wait a second. Did you just jump over the tribulation period, and you go from the church age? And you jump to the kingdom age without a tribulation. Is that what I just heard you guys? And that's in essence what they were saying. Is that's that the like, next? That's like was, jumping the shark on steroids. I, I I mean, it's like, oh my goodness. So let's just take out the book of Revelation chapter four through, uh, um, you know, 18. And we just go from this age to the kingdom age. And there's, there's no, there's no evil being punished. Um, there's no blood as high as the horse's bridles. Um, there, there, it's, 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 it's all good. And it sounds like you guys, not you, but them are wanting to tickle people's ears and not tell them the wrath of God is coming. That's right. Yeah. To me, it's just, how, how do you miss 
uh, that the end of the world is like Sodom and Gomorrah. And you're looking at it like this age isn't going to end with Sodom and Gomorrah. This age is going to end with with the whole world being Christianized. Yeah, I, I feel like, Jesus, are Jesus. we reading different Bibles? Did you take the king's pen knife and just remove like one third of the Bible? Wow. And you think about the hermeneutic that you have to have in order to do that. I mean, you have to allegorize the entire book of Revelation. Um, you have to allegorize the kingdom uh, in a lot of ways. You have to spiritualize the text. And, and, and it's like, yeah, that's that's what you have to do to make a square peg fit into a round hole theologically. And 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 so when does God's wrath come? When, when, when is it poured out on all humans? When is it the worst time in human history where Jesus said, had I not cut that time short, no flesh would survive. When, right. when does that come? Are we just going to just skip right over that and pole vault? Right? Ah, don't go, guys, don't worry about it. Jesus was just using hyperbole, guys. Don't take him seriously. I mean, the come world on. The most will grow cold due to an increase of iniquity. Right. Not, we can scratch that when we don't need it. Yeah, that's come on. Come on. It's all going to be good. It sounds like they're tickling people's ears. You know what's yeah. interesting, though, when I listen to this kind of stuff, I feel like, man, I am so glad that in my education, I did not take a class called Square Pegs and Round Holes. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, and that was that was one of the classes they took where they went. So um, and that and then Allegorization 101, they took that as well. Yep. <laughs> and straw man arguments. I, I, I mean, OK, here's the thing. Eric Metaxas is not a dumb guy. No, okay? I know. He's, He's not a dumb guy. And so, like, when you go to college and you take writing and different things, you learn, like, logical fallacies, what not to use in your argumentation and debates and stuff like that. And he used the number one thing that you're not supposed to do, straw man arguments. Yeah. And he just rolled. He made, like, 20 of them. Yeah. So, Eric, why? Why did you do that? And, you know, intellectually. You're a smart guy. Why did you do that? You know, you know, you're not supposed to do that. And, and so sometimes I, you, I, you, I sit back and I think this, there's something going on. There's it's it's a spiritual warfare. Yeah. And one of the things we have to be careful of, folks, <coughs> is we make sure that we are trembling at the plain statements of Scripture and not on cool sounding theologies that stroke our pride. You know, the this kingdom and dominion stuff appeals to religious pride because we are like the few, the proud, we're believing that we're going to go where no man has ever gone before, and, and we are going to trust the promises of God, and we're going to go beyond the New Testament apostles and prophets who, you know, they went for a little while, they dropped the ball, they stumbled, and the whole church has been in the wastelands for all these years, but we're going to go back to the real power of the Holy Spirit. We're going to go back to really trusting the promises of God. We're going to take faith and holiness to ground. It's never been on before. And you just watch. God's going to shake this world through us. Okay, well, this is a pride trip, folks, that is just a stinking semi-load of manure. Yeah, good point. Think about this. One of the tenants... <clears throat> Think about how prideful this tenant is of the of the seven pillars, seven mountain mandates, is that God desires for Christians to rise to power and govern the nation. OK, guys, that's one of the tenants. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Did you did you God desires Christians to rise to power to govern the nation? What? What? From what I read, God wants his son to rise to power and take his seat on David's throne and rule the world, uh, Psalm 2 and all the other messianic psalms. It puts a, it, the humans on the messianic level, Lee. Yes, it does. And it and also like, confuses the rod of iron in the time of grace. Yes, a, a bingo. You got it. That's it. And and uh, boy, howdy. Huh. <sighs> Uh, well, it, and that's, I keep going back to the fact, how do people miss this stuff? To me, this is like first grade, grade school, education level understanding of the Bible. This is not 
some extremely complex theological question. Now, you can get into the abstruse points of dispensationalism, and they get pretty complicated. But yeah. the simple fact of the distinction between Israel and the church, between the time of grace and the time of law, between what the Lord's doing right now in the church age, what he's going to do in the kingdom, these things are on the surface of the Bible. This is like the cream that rises to the top of the milk. You don't have to do anything. It's just going to rise. Yeah. How do you miss this? The only way you can miss it is intentionally pour the cream off and call the cream garbage. And that's what I'm left to conclude is, is the fact that um, this is not coming out of ignorance. That's this right. This is coming out of willfulness. That's right. That I want, I want the scriptures to say a narrative that I have in my head, and they won't bow a knee to the authority of the scriptures. That's what's happening. And I, when, when I see that, that scares me. That you, 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 me, anyone that's reading the Bible, you may not like what it says, but you have to bow a knee to it and submit to that authority of what God's saying, how reality is. And when someone is saying that I'm going to borrow uh, the messianic power, so to speak, and, and you know, God's going to raise me up to, to rule the nations. Uh, excuse me, that's only reserved for Jesus, not you. And that's the, 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 the height of arrogancy to think you're going to do that. But it must satisfy some egotistical desire in you if that fits your narrative. That's exactly right. To be honest, I, I'm, I'm at the point now where if someone calls himself an apostle or a prophet, I just, I tune them out. Yeah. They're, they're out. Well, it, it, they're, they're taking on things. And then another thing, you know, I've noticed with a, um, uh, some Bible studies that are out there. And, uh, you know, it, it's that old adage, 90% 90 true and then 10% wrong, right? And like this one Bible study was looking at this guy, uh, this gal, um, I was reviewing it for some ladies. And uh, I caught this and the lady was making the point that we're, we're firstborns. And I looked at that and I said, did she just really say that? The only one that's called the firstborn is the Messiah. That's right. We're, we're, we're the church of the firstborn, but we're not called firstborns. Only that that term is a messianic term for the Messiah. Amen. Today I have I have begotten you. Um, um, you know, Psalm Psalm two, uh, Psalm one ten, and all that, and then it points to the resurrection uh, of the Messiah. And they were taking that term, Lee, and applying it to themselves. That's right. And, and that's a messianic term. That's like calling yourself wonderful counselor, the mighty God. Those are messianic terms. It, that doesn't go to human beings. That goes to the Messiah. That's exactly and, right. And and so this, this book was laid out for these women. And, you know, they were taking those terms. It, it was that 10% that took a, that, that borrows a messianic term. Hey, you can't do that. And yet that's what leads people astray. That's right. That's right. And, and it's not a small mistake. Nobody no. is going to, I mean, if someone's writing books, uh, you're, you're going to have to understand that they're not, they're not coming at this like a babe in the Lord who can make an innocent mistake. If, if this is going into a book and they've got years under their belt, that's intentional yeah. and they mean something by it. Yeah. And, and, and this, <clears throat> this borrowing messianic terms, Remember, that's the, what the word of faith used to do. We're little gods and, yep. and little messiahs and stuff like that. And that that went all in, fed into that that frenzy of the word of faith movement, uh, which I thought was dead, but it still is around, apparently. But 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 taking messianic titles like that, that's a problem. But again, everyone's got to take a step back. Why? Why would an intelligent person that can read the Bible and the Bible's written on a fourth grade level? And main and plain doctrines of like the kingdom, Christology, you know, stuff like that. Like you're just saying, why would you not get that right? Write a book and 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 and, and peddle something that you know is not right, that you know hasn't hasn't been scholar, you know, that that if it was scholarly peer reviewed, you would get nailed for that. But they peddle it. Yep. And it's just like, well, you must have a desire, you know, self-aggrandizement. Maybe it's a desire to sell a book, make money. I mean, Peter talks about people being in the game for filthy lucre. Uh, and I think a lot of what's going on in Christianity, I call it the Christian and 
Christian industrial complex. Yeah. A lot of these people are in it for the money. There's a lot of money to be made and they sell their junk and false teachings and they make billions or not millions, I should say. <clears throat> but anyway, I could go on. But I'm sure there's questions. <laughs> yes, yes. So before we move on to the questions, do you got you want to make a, 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 a closing remark here to tie all the loose ends up and just encourage people to be faithful in this matter and discerning? Yeah, I think I think everybody out there, man, you got to have your radar up, man. Uh, don't trust me. Don't trust Lee. You trust the scriptures. Does what the person say match up to what the scriptures are saying? And, and again, it's not that you'd have to have a, a seminary degree. You just got to have discernment. That's and right. the way you have discernment, you just got to know the Bible and know the shepherd's voice, know what it says. And 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 then like Lee is saying, on um, know know what age you live in. You're in the church age. You're not in the kingdom age. The kingdom age is future. You're not in the mosaic period either. Mosaic period has been rendered inoperative. So you know we we, we don't practice mosaic law. We're under the law of the Messiah now, and and those are basic things because. When you go and approach the scriptures and you know what age you're in, what dispensation you're in, then you know how to interpret a particular passage. Is this for you or is this for Israel or is this for the kingdom? Like if you take Isaiah 65, for instance, and you read that, that's a kingdom passage. That's right. Where, you know, the you know, um, long longevity of life and and the, the, the animals are getting along together. They return back to eden uh you know like the garden of eden well the new apostolic reformation they put that now and that's that's not what's happening. that's in the future that 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 aspect and you got to know okay i'm reading isaiah 65 that's kingdom that's future so things like that and so that's how you rightly divide the word and i think people really need to focus in on that amen all right well let's move into the questions and we have a few here tonight got quite a few Okay, if in the book of Revelation, Israel worships the Antichrist, does that mean that they're going to take the mark of the beast? Well, it, 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 we're not sure how many do. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it, does, it doesn't say uh, in Revelation 13. We know that many do, uh, it, and it doesn't distinguish between Israel and Gentiles. It that's just right. says people do. And, and so our guess is, it will be Jew and Gentile. Some will, will do that and some won't. Um, and there, obviously we know this, that the remnant doesn't. Um, but um, some Jews will um, and, and some Gentiles will. Well, the majority of Gentiles will, obviously. Um, and so there's a remnant saved out of the Gentiles, remnant saved out of Israel. Um, the two thirds that Zechariah talks about um, uh, of Israel will be eliminated. And uh, that is... Um, uh, speculated that the two thirds, uh, most of them are unbelieving Israel and yep. they're, they're wiped out. That's the, the theological guess on that one. So, um, and then some of them perhaps, you know, that made the deal with the Antichrist, maybe some of them woke up, but some of them didn't. Um, and, and the point is, is that a remnant is being saved out of Israel and a remnant is being saved out of the Gentiles who refuse to bow any. And I'm telling you this, um, that's the point of no return. Whether Jew or Gentile worships the Antichrist and takes that mark, Revelation 14 says you don't come back from that. That's right. Um, uh, uh, unlike what MacArthur said. <laughs> oh, yeah. Remember Boy. that? He, he said you have, you'll get a, a, another chance after that. And it's like, well, Revelation 14 says there's no chance after you do that. And he's had a few opportunities offered him by men over the years to go back on that. And he's never gone back on it yeah. as far as I understand. Yeah, that was too bad. All right. Do you think the Abraham Accords could be the covenant that the Antichrist signs with many? I do not. Um, I take the position, uh, along with Dr. Frutenbaum, and, and I'm not a Hebrew expert. I know basic stuff, you know, they got me through seminary. But I, I, I turned my attention to Dr. Frutenbaum. I actually talked to Dr. Frutenbaum about the, the passage um, in uh, Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And what he tended, again, he knows Hebrew, he's a Messianic Jew. Uh, he's an expert on that. He confirmed to me that it is a brand new covenant. It is not based off a prior one. 
And what the Hebrew is indicating is, it, is it's a strong covenant and strong because of the Antichrist making the covenant. It's not based on pre-existing conditions. And so according to him, and I'm going to go with that because he knows Hebrew better than me, um, it is a brand new covenant that he makes. Um, and, and this is the problem that even Lee and I were talking about, like what happened in the fall. They were making a big deal out of what the, the UN was doing. Oh, this is a seven year treaty. And it's it, and, and we dispelled that. And that's obviously been proven to be wrong, obviously. So so my interpretation is it's a brand new covenant with the Antichrist based on the Hebrew. That's my interpretation. Yeah, and it's interesting, too, when the, the covenant with many, a lot of the Hebrew scholars say this is the many in Israel. This is kind of the same yeah. thing that we see in Matthew 24, where the love of the most, the love of the many shall grow cold. Well, uh -huh. why? It, it's the mystery of iniquity through the Antichrist. That's why mm -hmm. it grows cold. So yeah. that's really kind of paralleling with this treaty that's a treaty with Sheol. Yeah, and 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 you're making a good point. It's not, and, and like Frutenbaum will point out, it's not all, it's the many. That's and right. then Isaiah 28 calls these many the scornful men that do the covenant of death, uh, you know, that's annulled. And so it's not all of Israel that does it. That's uh, right. Maybe it's for political leaders or something, but people, other people say, no, we're not doing this. And maybe that's because of the witnessing of the 144,000 or the two witnesses. There's a lot of dynamics that he doesn't get all of them. That's and, right, and, and that remnant, there's a remnant that holds out, and and it's perhaps because of the the witnessing efforts that God is doing to Israel. Some brothers think the rapture is going to be visible, like Elijah, and like the ascension of Christ in in early in Acts, um, instead of invisible. What do you think? Well, I I, I think. That's a good. There's some speculation on that. Um, yep. uh, um, was we know a trumpet is sounded, and we know a voice, the archangel voice is is, is comes out. And I don't know if those are 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 um, things that would be audible to everybody in the world. Maybe they are. I don't know. I'm guessing. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> but maybe like um, oh, there was a situation. I can't remember the exact thing. Maybe Lee, you can help me out. There was a situation where they heard the back call of. God, the, the voice of God, it's called yeah. the back hole in Hebrew. And they heard the voice of God, but it sounded like thunder, but they didn't, they, they heard thunder, but they didn't hear the words. Yep. Maybe it's going to be something like that. I'm, I'm just using that as maybe precedent. So yeah. maybe they'll hear that. But then let's talk about then the twinkling of an eye. Yep. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and, and the, if that's even possible to even see the twinkling of an eye, from what I understand, from the Hebrew idiom is not the batting of a, a blinking of an eye. It's actually a reference to the, when someone recognizes somebody in their eye, which is even quicker than a blink apparently. Yeah, that's right. Right. So reckon it's a, it's a recognition in the eye, which is actually faster than a blink. Well, if it's that fast, who's going to see it. Yeah. Um, if it's that fast, I mean, it's instantaneous almost. So, I, you know, uh, the only thing that someone would see is someone disappear right in front of them in an instantaneous uh, moment. So that's maybe the only thing they could see if it's that fast. Um, so it's just uh, the only thing I would speculate on then, I, I would say they can't, they wouldn't see it because it's that fast, but it's possible they could hear something and maybe they think it's thunder or whatever, but it, but, you know, the speculation is that, what was told to John in John chapter four, uh, sorry, Revelation chapter four, come up here, that that's the call, that that's what the, the archangel will say, come up here uh, with the trumpet being sounded as well. But again, I don't know. It's just speculation. It's a fascinating question. Yeah, it's a good question. And, and I don't know if I have a, a, a good answer, but I can speculate. So, yeah, well, historically, uh, the invisible rapture that nothing was evident, but but just seeing clothes on the floor and, and people might see someone vanish in front of them. That was historically what most believe yeah. in the last decade or so brothers are starting to consider that maybe it will be visible as part of a testimony. Well, let's just let this issue play out. Just keep studying, keep thinking, and we'll see what happens when it happens. Yeah. All right.
is Satan? No, is Lucifer Satan's offspring? I never heard this question before. No, uh, they, that's one and the same. Uh, 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 Satan is just the term uh, 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 that was given to him. Um, but his real name is not Lucifer. That's a mistranslation of the Hebrew. It, it's His real name is Halel ben Shakar, uh, which means son of the dawn or son of the morning. Uh, that's yep. his real name. And uh, the King James, uh, you know, translated the latin or something i can't remember how it came up and it's it's a latin based thing and that's where they get the word lucifer so lucifer and satan are the same being yeah. but his name is actually halel ben shakar um son of the morning son of the dawn and so he's one and the same um he's the serpent he's the dragon um and those are all dealing with his activities um He's the adversary, obviously. It's what Satan means is to oppose, to, to be adverse and so, so, such. And so, um, no, it, it's it's the, the son of Satan, if you really want to be technical, is the Antichrist. He's the, it, the, the, the counterfeit trinity is Satan plays the role of the father. The Antichrist plays the role of the son and the false prophet play, uh, plays the role of the Holy Spirit. So there's a counterfeiting of the of the trinity. Uh, with Satan, the Antichrist, and the, the false prophet. Is the falling away in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, is that associated with the Jews signing on to the covenant in Daniel 9, 27? I do not believe so. I, I, I think that apostasy in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 has to deal with the church. Um, I don't believe it has to do with the falling away of Israel. And there's there's some things in there. Um, if, if I have time to unpack, I can. Um, I, I don't think Paul is writing to the Jews. He's writing to the church. He's writing to the Thessalonian church. And he has the church in mind in when he's talking about the, the falling away uh, before the time. Um, and so, um, there's key terms in there. Um, I wrote something up real quick. Hold on. Let me pull it up real quick. Uh, um, let me see if I can pull it up. I think, I think what, okay. What you have to realize, okay, then this is what I wrote. I was writing this out. Um, the word before, I, I think in the Greek, uh, the word is being used as proton. Yeah. Um, yeah. So which it means, uh, it indicates a chronological sequence before the tribulation, because that's what he's referring to. Yeah. And so the apostasy uh, and, uh, and the man of sin is first revealed, proton, and then the tribulation. So... It, it can't be referring to Israel. Um, it has to be referring to the church because it's happening prior to the tribulation. And I think the context is, is well established that we're, we're dealing with um, the, the apostasia of the church, not Israel. Let me, let me make another addition to this. Israel is not in, in belief right now. Yes, there's Messianic Jews, but the Messianic Jews are part of a part of the church and part of the remnant of Israel. Once the rapture happens, then what? There is no saved Jew or even saved Gentile for, right. for at least some period of time on the planet. Okay. In order to have apostasy, the definition of apostasy is to defect from previously held views that you have, orthodox views. So you're defecting from orthodox views to falling away from those orthodox views. So how can Israel apostatize when they're not holding orthodox views of God right now? Their, yeah. their Judaism is totally apostate. But I wouldn't use the term apostate. I would call it a false religion. Judaism is a false religion. So in order to apostate, you have to have right beliefs that you're falling away from. So Israel doesn't possess right beliefs right now. They won't possess right beliefs till three days prior to when they can convert over to the Messiah uh, during the tribulation period. So you, you, you can't use the word apostasy for Israel currently speaking. You have to use it for the church. 
So that's another thing. Yeah. Okay, next question. What do you think about a pre-Adamic civilization? I, I don't think that's a possibility. I think that comes from, obviously, the gap theory. Yep. Um, um, but um, that gap theory is typically used to, 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 to put in theological evolution, uh, typically speaking. Uh, and th that that's a that's called flaming snowballs. That's an oxymoron. There's no such thing as theological evolution. That God that God used the system of evolution um, to bring us to the point of then out of an Eve. Uh, and and that's the problem. Um, my kids are in Christian schools in uh, college, and their professors teach this garbage um, that there's pre-Adamic civilizations, Neolithic man, and it's a it's an accommodation to an evolutionary mindset, uh, unfortunately. Um, but this is, this is what I want to say. There is a thought that there wasn't a pre-Adamic uh, race. I mean, the first humans are Adam and Eve. There is a thought between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 that there was a, a previous earth that was a gem earth that satan had control of and lost and that's what ended up causing the 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 darkness and the watery masses in chapter two now if you're interested in that dr fruchtenbaum will point that out in his genesis commentary uh, and you can read a little bit more about that but that has nothing to do with humans that has to do with the angelic order and the fall of the angelic, uh, at least a, a third of the angels that fell with Lucifer on on the, the, the planet. Because one of the things you, you, you struggle with, to explain in Genesis 2 is how did we go to the, from uh, Genesis 1 to 2 where there's, there's the mass soup of, of blackness and darkness and wa a watery mass. And then God creates out of that, out of that chaos, he creates order. Well, what caused the chaos? And that's where they say the fall of Satan and his angels happened at that point in time. And that's where the judgment came from. So anyway, you can explore that on your own. That's just theological tidbits. If you want to uh, explore a little bit, that's Frutenbaum's Genesis commentary, if you're interested in that. Will Gentiles be permitted in Petra? It's a good question. I would I, I would imagine so if they go there. Um, we know it's primarily for, for Israel. But, um, hey, if there's Gentiles living in Israel at the time and they're believers and, and they're listening to the Messiah, why not? Um, remember, I, the, the precedent uh, I would use is what happened in the Exodus. Was it all uh, Israel that left in the Exodus? And it was not. Um, there was Egyptians that left and there was Gentiles that left uh, with them. Uh, mixed multitude, I think it says in Exodus, uh, primarily Israel, obviously, but there were Gentiles and Egyptians that accompanied them that believed in Yahweh. And I, you know, if there's Gentiles in the land at, in the, in the, at the midpoint of the tribulation, why not? Um, they would have the same scriptures. They would have the same directives and say, hey, I'm, I'm with you boys. Uh, I'm going to go hide out with you guys because I know exactly what he's prepared for you. We're all going to go to Petra. I'm going to camp out with you. I, I wouldn't put it out of the realm of possibility. But if you're a Gentile in the United States, you're not going to get there, obviously. <laughs> you know, you would have to be in the land to be able to get there, or at least in the vicinity to get there. Um, couldn't Israel put up a tabernacle even faster than the temple and use the tabernacle while they're waiting for the temple to be finished? Absolutely. That's a good point. And, and uh, I, I wouldn't put it past them. Um they, they, guys, I mean, if you study uh, and you look at what they're doing, they're ready to go. Um, they, um, I, uh, two weeks ago, I was, I was by the wall outside of uh, the Western area, not the Western wall, but the, the, the outside of the old city, the Western part of the old city, where they actually took the altar uh, they, they didn't have it there at the time, but uh, one of the, the persons that we were dealing with, he was saying that they actually brought their altar there and they used it. Uh, they have been burning animals as whole burnt offerings on this altar and have been using it. And they did it. Uh, he showed me the location on the outside of old, old Jerusalem, 
on the western side. And uh, they're like breaking it in. It's just kind of the way he put it. They're 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 ready to go. So you're absolutely right. They don't need a temple. They could put up the tabernacle. Now, in concert with this um, is the Ark of the Covenant. And this is a fascinating thing I think everyone probably uh, enjoys is when I talk to people in Israel and, and that's connected to this whole rebuilding of the temple and whatnot, they claim they know where the Ark is. They claim it's in a, in a, in a, a underneath the Holy of Holies uh, in a sub subterranean cave that Solomon built. Um, if you ever get a chance, it's very interesting. Go on the Western Wall tour near the uh, the Western Wall Hotel, and you want to do the Western Wall tour, and uh, it'll take you by where in I think it was a night in the 1980s, Rabbi Getz uh, was starting to burrow and make a tunnel <clears throat> through the uh, the uh, the Herodian stone going directly right under the, the the Dome of the Rock. And he started burrowing in there, and they were getting radar uh, signals back that there was metal somewhere ahead of them. Well, the Arab world found out, and they went ballistic and told them, you better stop sealing that, that, that cave or we're going to have a holy war on your hands. So it's there today. You can see the cave. They believe that the Ark of the Covenant's in there because of vertical holiness. So interesting. There's a little bit of Indiana Jones trivia for you guys. <laughs> Brandon, are you still taking donations for the IDF soldiers and taking them to Israel? Yes, we are. We, we uh, You can go on our website at rockharborchurch.net. Go on Bless uh, uh, bless Israel giving tab. And we, we, we have um, helping the IDF. And now I, I am working with the IDF families as well, because what's happened, I was talking to one of the commanders in Unit 66, and uh, this is one of the units that we help. We got drones for and all that other stuff. And he was telling me, Brandon, a lot of our soldiers have not been able to work because they've been on the front lines and they're fighting and, the, and it's you know 100 plus days now. And so they're not working. So they're not, they don't have an income coming in anymore. And what the IDF pays is like peanuts. They don't, that's not enough to sustain them. So their families are getting hit really, really hard. So what we have done, we added another giving tab on that Bless Israel area of helping the families of the IDF. Okay. And so you can donate to help those families. Now, what, what we're doing, we're not doing social gospel stuff. We are we're literally helping them with finances, material goods, and we're using the messianic believers to share the gospel. And so we're using these items that we provide as a springboard for the gospel. Yeah. And what's happening, it's opening their hearts because they cannot imagine why we would want to help them when the whole world hates them. And so the Messianic believers that we're working with on the ground explain to them, well, it's because of Yeshua. Yeshua, it, it, they do this for the love of Yeshua and that the Messianic believers are able to witness to them. And I'm telling you guys, it is the most open I have ever seen Israel. Not, you know, just not everybody, but the, the IDF soldiers and, and their families and stuff, because they cannot believe we sent them drones. And the drones actually saved some of their lives because the drone was able to find tunnels before they had to put a man on the ground. So it's stuff like that um, it, that it just blows them away. And I, I tell them, hey, I'm doing it for Yeshua. And I, I, I continue to tell them and they're, they're, they're hearing it, man. So um, it's, it's, it's providing a, 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 a physical need, but bridging it to their spiritual need. And Amen. that's why we, we, we are taking such an interest in doing that. So if you want to help, that's how we're doing it. Yeah. Well, we still got a whole string of questions left, Brandon. If you need to check out, I would fully understand. But we got about 10 questions. Okay, left. go for it. We'll, we'll try to go as much as we can. I'll probably call it quits at eight. All right. <coughs> um, do you think we'll be gone before World War III gets underway? <laughs> I wish we could. Uh, I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know. That's a good question. I, I, I don't know how to answer that. I mean, it, it's both scenarios. It's both and. Uh, I mean, we can be raptured tonight, for goodness sake, and which yeah. would be fantastic. 
But um, what do we promised? We're promised to be raptured prior to the tribulation. So if the Lord tarries and decides that we're going to be raptured closer to the start of the tribulation, somewhere in that neighborhood, then we're going to see you some more. Yeah. And, th and that's been the big surprise that we're all of us in the prophecy world are sure, really starting to understand is we're a little shocked at how much we've seen so far. That's right. And a lot of us are saying, hey, I thought we'd be gone by now, but it's not. And uh, um, and so I think you have to have both narratives. And that's what I've been telling everybody. Have the narrative, of course, you can be raptured, but also possess the narrative that if the rapture is close to the tribulation, I might have to endure more. And if we endure more, what's the purpose for that? Well, I can already tell you why what's happening right now. It's the separation that needs to happen in the yep. church. We are having issues that are now separating the church out. And I can tell you the big one. And Tom and I and Billy and, and Lee have talked about this. The big separator that, that's recent is Israel. That is separating a lot of churches and believers. And uh, God is using those types of things to say, you want to see what the church really looks like? Let me take the cover off. And so if, if the Lord decides to tarry and, 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 and reveal more of the church, then I would prepare that way too. So have both narratives. Why would God cloak his word for, I don't know, 12, 1500 years from, you know, the early church through Martin Luther? I don't know so much if it's, it's God cloaking it. Um, it's a pan, there's a penalty attached to suppressing truth. I, yep. I know that. And that the more you suppress truth, the darker you become. If you look at, um, uh, what is it? Uh, let me pull it up real quick. Because um, I don't, I don't, I don't want to lay the blame on God because God's not the one that does this. But um, in, uh, let's see if I can pull this up real quick. What happens is people do it to themselves. And even believers can do this to themselves. And people think, well, believers are immune from being deceived or uh, uh, believers are immune from going spiritually blind. Um, actually, no. Um, let me read this to you. Uh, this is uh, 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, obviously, and then verse 8. So what's happening is Peter is saying, like, hey, add to your... Add to your uh, your your faith virtue, virtue knowledge, to knowledge self control, and he's basically talking about spiritual maturity. Okay, like growing, and then he says this: for if these things are yours, so if you're growing, right, and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the yeah. Lord Jesus Christ. So he says you're going to produce. Okay, but here's the negative: if you don't grow, if you don't grow, here's what happens. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. So 2 Peter is warning believers that if you don't grow, you're going to get myopic. The word, is, the word in Greek is myopic. And then you actually go blind spiritually. So what does that say? There's a penalty attached to not, to, to, to not growing there's a penalty attached for suppressing truth, Romans chapter one. And so it's it when you look at the Reformation and you look at those dark periods of, 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 of church history, what was happening? The suppression of the truth and the refusal, the refusal to grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because what were they hanging on to? They were hanging on to old Catholic doctrine. So, for instance, Martin Luther, John Calvin, what were they hanging on to? Okay, they got, they, they kept saying sola scriptura, but why wouldn't they let go of Augustine? Yeah. Why wouldn't they not let go of his hermeneutic? Why would they not let go of his uh, uh, millennialism or his theological determinism? Yeah. And, 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 and so you, you want to say these are sharp guys, but, but it's because they wouldn't give up these theological distinctives that came from the Catholic Church rather than sola scriptura. And that's why it went dark. It wasn't God. It was man doing it. If you have a golden calf, it will cost you. <laughs> yeah. And you will sacrifice to that golden calf. That's um, right. And they did. I mean, you think about 
the, the results of their bad theology, uh, the anti-Semitism that came from Luther and Calvin because they didn't understand the role of Israel and, and the prophetic scenario of the kingdom age and whatnot. Wow. I mean, some of the things Luther said and Calvin said would shock you about what they said about the Jews. That's right. So don't say dispensationalism is a secondary matter, folks. It actually has practical ramifications. Oh, If you're a dispensationalist consistently, you'll be living consistently in the church age. If you reject dispensationalism, you will consistently be mixing the church age and the Mosaic law. You will mix them. Oh, totally, man. You'll become a Judaizer. Yep. Mm-hmm. Will we be able to pray for people when we're in heaven? Interesting. Um, the souls under the altar were praying. Yeah, they, yeah, they they are praying, um, and and then you have the incense that reflects the prayers of the saints in the altar. So I would imagine you can, based on those passages, um, that goes into how much do they know? Um, yep. I don't know how much they know. Uh, it, it seems to be that the souls under the altar knew they had uh, been martyred and they wanted they wanted God to take vengeance. I know that. So they knew, they were aware of that and they were told to wait a little longer. Um, and so um, prayers are based on information. So it seems to indicate that in heaven they do have some types of information. Um, I don't know how extent that information is, but they do know to some extent. And they have a they have a sense of passing of time as well, because with the altar with the souls under the altar praying and making their requests, they're told to wait a little longer. And so there's a, a passage of time, obviously, and then later on you hear that there's a silence in heaven for a half hour. And so, um, so that being the case, I, I think you can, and. And that that there's a sense of time and there's a, there's a sense of something that they know that's going on. Yep. So to, to whatever extent, I don't know, but uh, you can't say they don't know anything because the, the souls under the altar know. And then 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 when you hear the proclamations in the book of Revelation about an, whether it's angels proclaiming or whatever, uh, Babylon, the great is destroyed, you know, and all those proclamations, that's information. Yes. Uh, being given to people in heaven that something's happening on earth that that's, you know, Babylon's destroyed now. So it seems to indicate that they do know, which would indicate that 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 they would be able to pray intelligent prayers is what I'm trying to say. Amen. I heard recently that Satan won't be pushed out of heaven until the mid part of the tribulation. But Jesus said he saw Satan fall like lightning. How do you reconcile these two thoughts? Yeah, I, I, the fall of Satan, um, fall like lightning, um, is is a euphemism. Um, it doesn't mean he doesn't have access to the third abode. It means that he fell from his position. He lost his position as the anointed cherub um, that uh, Ezekiel talks about. And, um, and so his fall is a positional fall uh, and... And it had to do with his pride. And that's what Jesus was trying to refer to with the disciples. I saw Satan fall. And why? Because they were prideful that even the demons uh, obeyed their voice. And he was trying to relate why Satan fell from his position. It was because of his pride. Because the fall of Satan, he still has access to God's throne, even though he fell and lost his position. How do we know? Look, Job chapter 1. He's, he's talking with God. He's having an audience with God. And then um, in Revelation, it, it calls him the what? The accuser of the brethren who accuses us day and night before God. So he still has access to God. Um, but by, by Revelation 12, he seems to be make a run on the throne. Uh, Michael puts that down. And he is then sentenced uh, at that point. To, he's confined to earth. And he's no longer allowed into the third abode. But even today, he, he has access to God in the third abode. So we, one of the ways he exercises his, his position as accuser of the brethren. Yes, and that's what he's doing in front of God. If you want to know what he's doing, that's what he's doing. He's accusing you and I. Um, and, and so, but then to be technical, 
Under, understand that heaven is dynamic. It changes and it even changes locations later on. It comes to earth. Um, the new Jerusalem that's discussed in Revelation 21 doesn't permit evil to, in, to come into that. So what you have to keep in your mind is that there are different parts, if you want to call it, of heaven in the third abode. You have the heavenly tabernacle that Moses patterned the, 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 you know, the tabernacle on. So you have the temple. That's why you have the altar, right, of this, the, uh, that the, the saints are under. You, so you have the heavenly tabernacle. You have God's throne. And then you have New Jerusalem. So to be technically uh, correct, Satan cannot enter New Jerusalem. It, it, nothing ever comes in there. But can he go into the throne room of God? Yes. Can he go to the tabernacle? Yes, because he desecrated it, by the way. He desecrated the tabernacle, uh, Hebrews chapter 9. Um, and so uh, so you got to you got to keep those things in balance when you're thinking about the third abode or what we call heaven. Are we presently in the time of the releasing of the four horsemen? Uh, no, no. Uh, um, uh, the four horsemen are released when the seals are broken, uh, according to Revelation chapter six. So I do not believe that that that's happening right now. I know there's some are, but then that's that you start having a bleed of tribulational events and seal of judgments that's outside of the seven year tribulation. And I think you start getting into theological problems. If you say the four horsemen are like marching right now and the seals, some of the seals are broken, even though we're not in the seven year tribulation, you got, you got a, a, a problem there with the seven years. And how are you going to to take them? Literally, you, you really can't. If they're happening now, you've got to be figurative. You got to water them down. Mm -hmm. and, and 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 I get what they try to do. I, I understand the argumentation. Like, because but but what I would say is they're stage setting right now. That's not seal breaking. That's it's right. Stage setting. And and could the you know if we're if we're living in the last time is the Antichrist alive? He might be if we're if we're this close. But that doesn't mean the seal has been broken of, of, of him yet. That's right. He's not been revealed. He's not been allowed. He's being actually restrained, even though he might be alive. So yeah. I think don't let's not confuse stage setting with seal breaking. Is tithing a New Testament mandate? No. Giving is a New Testament mandate. But giving is in five areas. Uh, and given his Holy Spirit directed at the first of each week. So you have the, the New Testament believer has to rely on the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit tells them to give. Now, there'll be five different areas according to the New Testament. So this is different than this is the problem that Lee and I were trying to talk about of not bringing Mosaic law into the law of the Messiah. So that, so you probably have heard bring your tithes to the storehouse using Malachi chapter three. Right. Or. Or even using Abraham as an example of tithing 10% to Melchizedek one time in his life after a war. And that's wrong. Under the New Testament, the, the giving exists. It's to be done on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, and it's Holy Spirit directed. Now, the five areas will be directed is this. Number one, it'll be to a local church, possibly. He might direct you to the local church. Number two, a, 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 t a Bible teacher. Number three, some type of missionary or ministry that you're supporting. Number four, a Jewish believer or Jewish organization that evangelizes. That's Romans chapter 15, verse 27. And then or, or, uh, along with the, the category of missionary ministry, it could be a brother or sister in need. Okay, that's James. And, or, or and the last one is your own family. That's the fifth one. He who doesn't have help his family is worse than an infidel. So your giving will center on those five areas and all of them will be Holy Spirit directed. And one week, the Holy, Holy Spirit might direct you to give to help a brother in need. One, another week, he might give, tell you to give to your local church. Another week, he might say to give to a messianic organization as our obligation of Romans chapter 15, verse 27. Or he might direct you to all five areas in one week. But this is understanding the law of the Messiah and not bringing Mosaic law into our giving. 
And, and, and as you could see, if you brought Mosaic Law and you only could give to the storehouse, which they claim is the church, then how am I ever going to help a Messianic believer? How am I ever going to help a brother in need? How am I going to help another ministry? How am I ever going to help another missionary? It limits me, and that's been the, the joke uh, financially that the church has played on people, uh, unfortunately, in America. I hate to tell you that, but it's been a, it's been a major problem. Amen, brother. I couldn't agree more. When the rapture happens and some of our loved ones end up going through the tribulation, are when we're in the kingdom, are they going to recognize us? If if they made it through, that's the that's the question. Uh, if if they got saved and and they were and then uh, of course they will they will recognize us. Yes, uh, and and so first of all, they got to get saved. And if they get left behind and if they get saved, it's a good chance, probably a, a very good chance they're going to get martyred and they're going to die. And, and so, um, uh, very when few. They get resurrected. Resurrected. What's that? And then they get resurrected. Then they can get resurrected. So they'll have a resurrected body so that you have that. But if they, let's just play the scenario out that they get saved and somehow they survive. They're one of the few that do, uh, make it through and they go in to populate the messianic kingdom. Of course, they will recognize you, of course, but um, you will be in a glorified body and they won't. They'll have a mortal body that survives and you will be glorified. So you will be perfect. Um, but um, initially, they may not. They may not recognize you um, just like they didn't recognize Jesus initially. Remember that um, they didn't initially recognize Jesus until they heard his what his voice. And then then it popped up and it's like. Okay, we recognize them. So I, you might initially not be recognized, but eventually you will be. What about the Miami Mall incident? Was that real? Was it staged or AI or was it just something else? Uh, you're going to have to clue me in on that one because I missed that story. What, what happened there? Oh, a couple of weeks back, there was a, you know hundreds of police cars gathered around the mall in Miami and there was reports go around social media that there was three Nephilim walking around in the, in the mall what? and outside. What? Yeah. And, uh, okay, was, I'm sorry. I was in Israel. So I was checked out on the Nephilim in Miami, man. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, what? here's the upshot of it is, is some of the, the leading, uh, Nephilim experts like Ellie Marzuli don't believe that this was a Nephilim appearance. They're not sure what was going on. They're, they're, they're dubious about the official story that it was just kids lighting off fireworks. Um, the whole story got clamped down, but the, nothing has been forwarded to this point that looks like real video of a real Nephilim. There's just a couple uh, videos that someone probably made at home with their, who knows. Anyway, I don't think it's real. Two more. Well, I got three more here real fast. Uh, okay. What does what is grieving the Holy Spirit? Yeah, grieving the Holy Spirit is obviously not doing what the will of God is for you and disobeying him. So it's it's acting in ways that are in disobedience. Um, obviously, um, all sin would grieve God. Um, and, and then there's uh, the aspect of quenching the Holy Spirit, which is, is not allowing the gifts to be used in the body of Christ and, and not letting them flourish as they, they need to be, but, uh, grieving him, it's a problem. And, uh, unfortunately we all at times do that. And, uh, we have to do first John one nine and confess that and come before the Lord and, uh, not do that anymore. But, um, it's it's a it's a, a thing that that happens and why because the Holy Spirit lives inside of us and we can desecrate the temple that we it where we have will the post-millennial and NER type people lose rewards for the bad theology absolutely uh, and, and 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 understand this there are rewards uh, for having proper theology because proper theology leads to proper behavior. Yep. And if you, if you have misunderstandings, um, then you're in a form of apostasy and apostasy allows you to lose rewards. So it's directly linked. So, so, so yes, wrong theology is going to lose rewards. And here's the interesting thing, too. 
when it talks about the 144,000 being without spot and blemish, um, that is a term that is used that, that even Dr. Fruchtenbaum will note that they have their proper theology. They're, 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 the 144,000 do not have dominionism. They, they have proper eschatology, proper soteriology, proper theology, proper bibliology. And that means they're without spot and blemish. That's the goal of all of us to be without spot and blemish theologically in order to get those rewards. What's the time of Jacob's trouble? Time of Jacob's trouble is the seven year tribulation. That's, that's what it refers to. And it's Daniel's 70th week, basically. Can someone go down the NER road after they, like if they believe the regular gospel and then they go down the NER road, can they be considered born again? Yeah, because once you're born again, that can never be taken away. I believe in eternal security. Yep. So, I mean, we have a lot of questions like that. Someone gets saved at a BBS when they were 12 and then, then you know, they, they end up in some type of weird cult or something. But did they really get saved? Well, that's between them and God. But the, the, theoretically, if someone believes in Jesus and he gives them eternal life, that can never be taken away from them. Uh, and, so can someone get into prodigal son living? Can they apostatize? Yes, they can. Can people die out of fellowship? Yes, they can. Ananias and Sapphira did, and so did the Corinth church. Some of them died out of fellowship. That's right. Um, and so, yeah. All right. Well, we're wrapped up with the questions. Maybe you could give us a, a very brief word of encouragement to close and close us out with prayer. And then if you don't mind, can you hang around for about two minutes afterwards? I got a question I need to ask you. Okay. Well, guys, my, my admonition to you, as you can see, it's important to know scripture and you got to know it more than ever because don't rely uh, on the talking heads. Don't rely on, on what you hear on YouTube because, man, there's a lot of junk out there. You got to know the right guys to go to, obviously, but man, you got to do your own study too. You got to study the word. Uh, you, you invest in good commentaries, invest in good Bible helps. Look, there's free stuff online that you can even find out the Greek and the Hebrew words and do your studies. You need to do that. You need to be a student of the word. Uh, and in a five minute devotional is not going to cut it these days. You have to do very hard study so you don't get fooled. And so you can up the up your level of discernment and you can spot the wolves in sheep's clothing, guys. So, yeah. so study hard, my friends. But, and we, we want to pray. Like We're going to pray, right? Yep. Oh, okay, yes, pray. Father, thank you for this evening that you have given us. I thank you for Lee and all the work he's doing. And I thank you for our audience out there. Continue to bless them, encourage them, give them the hope that we have that Jesus is coming soon. And Father, help us to, to do what you've called us to do until you call us home. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, folks, take care. Keep pressing onwards. Keep pressing upwards. Keep your eyes on the skies because soon we're going to get our eternal prize when the Lord Jesus Christ meets us in the clouds. See you later, everybody.